Uh, welcome board members and members of the public. Thank you for joining today. Uh, I am Paul Castillo, Vice Chair. We have member Guido Boclioni, Carol Quant, Karen Spence, and Omar Lopez, board members present today. Uh, we also have our main host, Julie Schultz, and Amy Hennessy. Uh, the host will coordinate the comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take notes on any follow-up meetings. As a reminder to all present, please silence your cell phones. Additionally, the City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing, providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and will not tolerate hate speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Madam Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Vice Chair Castillo. Effective immediately, all public comments will be provided in person or via email in advance of the meeting. There are cards located at the entrance. Please complete the card for each item you wish to speak on and place it in the basket. You will be called up by name when your item number has been discussed and it is open to the public comment. After an agenda item has been presented, vice, the vice chair will ask the board members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following, the item will be open for public comments. You will be asked to approach the podium and state your name for the record. Once the vice chair is called for public comment, you will raise your hand and wait to be called to the podium, even if a comment card has been completed. Each public comment is limited to three minutes, and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that have been received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. With that, I call the September 27th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 5.07 p.m. All right. Madam Host, may we have a roll call? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts, Vice Chair Castillo. Present. Board Member Boclioni. Present. Board Member Cruz. Board Member Lopez. Present. Board Member Spence. Here. Board Member Quant. Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the ex exception of Chair Pitts and Board Member Cruz. Uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor for public comments on non-agenda matters. This is the time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on the agenda, but are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction of the Board of Community Services. Our agenda reflects an email comment has been included in this agenda. Madam Host, do we have any public comments? We have no public comment in person. All right. All right, then with that, we will move to item four, uh, approval of minutes. Uh, board members, are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of the August 23rd, 2023? All right. Uh, seeing no hands, the minutes from the August 23rd, 2023 meeting are approved as submitted. Uh, next, item five. Acting Director Santos, please give your report on upcoming and accomplished events. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, as part of the attachment, you have upcoming and accomplished events. I just wanted to highlight as an accomplished event, um, we had a Tacos with a Cop Neighborhood Service and Violence Prevention partnered with Santa Rosa Police Department on September 19th at our Apple Valley uh, neighborhood. And uh, it was great. We had tacos and fun discussions and lots of booths with lots of information and resources for the community. It was a really good time. And then as far as upcoming, I wanted to highlight uh, something you don't hear about that often is our other train, not the Howarth Park train, but our Redwood Empire Life Steamers train at Youth Community Park. It's the last weekend of operation on October 7th and 8th. So um, if you haven't been out there to ride the train, uh, I encourage you to check it out. End of my report. Uh, uh... Thank you, Jen. And will you kindly provide the director updates at this time? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. I wanted to uh, report that the we had a few things at Council recently. The Finley Aquatic Center construction contract was approved with Waterworks 
at council on the 12th of September. And we are in the process of scheduling the construction and working on all the details before the construction starts. Um, we had a recreation division update at council as well. It was very well received and went uh, really nicely. Congratulations to Jeff on a great job. And we also recently were approved for um, a professional services agreement with a Quadriga landscape architect for Kiwana Springs Community Park uh, design and construction drawings. So uh, we're excited to get started on that. It's been uh, 2006 since we've owned that land. So really looking forward to getting that uh, community park uh, ready for that community who's been long ready. <laughs> um, the general plan was also discussed at the council. So the uh, council members also had their opportunity to provide uh, input now on the general plan and a public forum. So we'll be working with the um, planning and economic development department to finalize our comments as well. And then we have upcoming at Council, we have on the 10th of October, the Violence Prevention Partnership will have their five-year strategic plan um, available for feedback. And then just a little bit more about Finley Aquatic Center. We will have some social media information out to the community about the closure of the pool and where folks can find uh, places to swim and recreate in an aquatic setting. Uh, soon, but uh, for now I'll update that we are targeting November 3rd as the closure for Finley as we prepare, prepare for the construction. And uh, we're looking at an alternative schedule for Ridgeway Swim Center uh, from November 6th through uh, whenever Finley reopens in the spring of 2024. Um, and we um, We'll be, what the thought is right now is doubling hours of lap swim at Ridgeway Pool to help with increased users from four to eight hours per day. And for water fitness, looking at a nine to 10 a.m. water fitness class moving to Ridgeway seven days per week. And a 7.30 p.m. water fitness class is moved uh, to Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then our 5 p.m. water fitness class moved to, move for Fridays. And uh, this is always something I've heard about for at least the last 10 years now. The pool temperatures at both pools are a little bit different. So we've looked at a compromise between the, the cooler pool, uh, which is used for um, our um, competitive swimmers and the little bit warmer, just a little bit warmer swimmers who um, prefer it for our recreational swim. So we're compromising between 79 degrees and 84 and, and settling on 82 degrees. So. Just wanted to put that out there. It's always a, a point of interest. Uh, and I want to announce to the board that I will be bringing back a discussion topic for regarding the Southeast Greenway in October uh, in conjunction with our Southeast Greenway partners uh, so they can get an update on what's happening out there. Uh, there was also a request from the board at the last meeting to know more about how to report graffiti. And so one of the ways that you can report graffiti is the public works mainline. The public works team are the primary responders to graffiti everywhere, including parks. And that's at 543-3800. Um, you can also call the parks mainline. If you just, if you see parks in a graffiti, you can always call the mainline at 543-3770 and we'll get it handled. We'll get, um, we'll work, we work really closely with public works and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, and just a brief update on park naming has come up at the last couple meetings. Um, we are um, still holding on bringing forth any uh, new park naming uh, requests um, at the request of the board so that we can update the naming policy city what has a citywide naming policy for parks. Um, we recognize that it, it needs to provide a little bit more direction to citizens to staff to board members to council members and uh, we're looking forward to updating that policy once the board ordinance is finished. So we, you know, we have limited staff so we're looking at completing that one first and then we'll start the naming policy. Um, hopefully at the beginning of the year. Um, and last but not least, uh, well, it's not last either. <laughs> We're working on what's called an integrated pest management system. And that's how we work with herbicides, 
um, and in parks uh, versus mechanical means. We it's a, it's an integrated system, and we will be staff will be at the climate action subcommittee discussing the integrated pest management system that will be a citywide pest management system for the entire city, including parks, at the October fourth meeting. And it doesn't look like I wrote it down. Oh, here we go. At 4 p.m. in the city's chamber building at 637 First Street. Um, park staff as well as staff from water and fire will be there um, to talk to the Climate Action Subcommittee about that. Um, the other thing was there was a request to understand a little bit more about what the Parks Department is doing about the uh, beetle that is infesting oak trees and can be... Uh, cause a lot of damage. It's moved into the Sonoma County area and definitely here in Santa Rosa. And so we've had some trainings. It's still early in the trainings and uh, the industry is still looking for best management practices. But what we're hearing early on is that treating with fungicide and insecticide is an effective method for um, more, uh, getting beetles out of the area when we recognize that. Um, there's a recommendation for leaving infected trees and branches on site for a minimum of a year after they're cut if we know that they're infected with the beetle. Um, chipping, burning, and masticating in place is also recommended. And um, we are looking at ways of implementing those processes and coming up with some more uh, best management strategies in the industry. And we'll keep the board updated as we know but this is part of the part of the um, environment now in Sonoma County and we are addressing it and these are the things that we'll be implementing as we move forward and that is the end of my report. <laughs> Thank you that was, that was a great report. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to reports from the board. Uh, board member? Board member Juan? Uh, may I ask Jen a question regarding the director updates? Oh of course yes. Um, regarding the Finley Aquatic Center um, having read the supplied um, public comment letter and listening to other members of the public, they assume that the JC swimming pool is just waiting for us to ask if we can use that. Has that been addressed? Yeah, I would invite our recreation deputy up here to address that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Jeff Tivis, Deputy Director of Recreation. Um, so yeah, we've been reaching out to a lot of partners. Uh, there's actually elements that already took place with the JC coming in place that allowed us to accommodate as much as we have. For example, Master Swim used to take up morning portions out at Ridgeway. Um, that program moving allows us to bring in some of the lap swim that we've done. So there's some of it is, has been proactive. And so now that this project is finally taking place, it looks like, well, why aren't you doing things? Well, some of those things happened a year ago um, in preparation. Um, as well, and again, not just the JC, but we have a list of pools that, that we'll be providing to the public as well. And we've been reaching out to those pools that, whether they offer lap swim or they offer um, water aerobics uh, classes, uh, water fitness classes, um, that we'll be providing a list with contact information for the public as well. Um, we really, I mean, we realize there's still going to be an impact. I want to applaud the staff for the work. Again, they've been working on this for over a year um, and looking proactively and, and how we accommodate. The reality is there's going to be an impact of going from two pools to one pool. Um, a lot of people will tell you that two pools in San Rosa isn't enough. So, um, you know, the, I think the long-term uh, benefit of having some ADA work done at Finley, replastering the pools, having a new splash pad feature there, um, you know, for, for many, many years, 30-year old infrastructure there, um, to have that updated, uh, we're aware it's going to be about a six month or so. Um, you know, impact on, on our participants, uh, but we really want to do the best that we can. And, and realizing that these are Santa Rosa features, right? There's not Finley Pool and Ridgeway Pool, it's, it's Santa Rosa Aquatics. And so uh, we want to do the best job that we can as Santa Rosa accommodating our, our public. And yes, if some people feel like, hey, this isn't ideal for me for whatever the reason is, the pool's more crowded, the temperature of the pool, whatever those are, then providing what else is available in the community that might be a better fit for them during the time of construction. Uh, great. And following up on that, uh, was there communication from the city to this individual? I, I know they were seeking a response. Was that received? Did someone reach out? Not yet, but we definitely will follow up with that, uh, with that person. 
surprised that you do that. Uh, thanks. Um, I wanted to report out on the merit award ceremony that happened two weeks ago. Ooh, we right. had about 100 people right here at Finley, um, and we gave out 14 awards. And it was uh, it was very it was a wonderful program, if I do say so myself. It, was a, it it's a really good committee. We work really hard, put a lot of hours in, and um, it has it turned out even better than we thought it was going to. Thank you to my board members who were able to come. We appreciate that very much. And we had city council people there, and, and everybody was uh, pretty darn excited to get it. A lot of photos taken, and so, uh, and so that sort of declares what I did for the last month. <laughs> I didn't go to the park. I went to Finland. <laughs> nice. uh, anyone else? I was going to ask you about the uh, certificates. I had not seen those before. Who um, issues those certificates, and how do you go about getting them? Because they're not local recognition, their statewide recognition, right? Right. right. Talk we about those we talked to our state rep who gets them for us. They offered them up. And, and they're from whose offices? From uh, Senator Mike McGuire. But we've had them for the last four years. I, I just never saw them up close. Oh, before. okay. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very exciting to get to. Yeah. Worthy of framing, yes. is what we say. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. Any additional updates? So um, I wanted to give a shout out to Jen, who suggested that um, the uh, Rural Cemetery nominate one of the volunteers who ended up getting an yes. award. Yes. And um, she, uh, this is Ruth Norman, who's a very humble volunteer who's been preening for the last couple of weeks, and we gave her a standing ovation the next day. Um, just wonderful to see people who go unrecognized being recognized for things that they do so it's selfishly practice. over not one year, yeah. but many, many, many years. Yeah. It's it's it was the food awesome. bank people had 3,500 hours. Um, and think um, about that. The woman from the Jewish Community Center, the nurse. Yes. Um, just 24 years, but who's counting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So um, I was able to participate in a couple of um, volunteer events, one at Olive Park, which was a joint effort between Parks Maintenance and uh, the Creeks and Stewart program, and that was lovely to see different branches of the city and uh, the public working together and also a neighborhood group who um, did some ivy removal and native plant planting at North Park. Um, more neighborhood parks that could truly be owned by the neighbors, um, keeps them cleaner, keeps them healthier, and uh, frees up some staff time. And also, um, I was able to spend way too many hours at the Royal Cemetery where we had uh, 16 sold out nighttime tours. Nice. Is that only last weekend? <laughs> yeah. yeah, last weekend. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, what about Lopez? Um, I just want to, I guess I will give my update. I've been taking care of my cousin a lot recently, so I've been taking to a lot of new parks and exploring them with her. Um, so she's been really enjoying it. Um, we went to five different parks. I have the list and I lost my list, so I will follow up on that list with you. But we got like four or five different parks. It was one every week with a bonus one uh, on the second week. So it's been really fun. It's been a really good excuse for me to get out and go to these parks and sort of getting to share them with her. So it's been wonderful. And she has some people. <laughs> She's fine. Oh, that's gonna be great feedback. Uh, board member I was at uh, Southwest Community Park uh, again, and I took some photos of the enormous crowds there on the weekend. And uh, just, uh, it, it uh, that park just blows my mind. It's it's 
beautiful. I had uh, one little problem with it, and I notified uh, Jen. And the next morning, I went by. I was like, oh, yeah, it's already done. <laughs> the grass was all cut down on the parking lot and everything. So now you can actually see the whole facility. It's beautiful. And it's being kept up really nice. Good work, Jen. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I don't have much of an update. Went to Strawberry Park again. Very cool park. My kids enjoyed it. Uh, they had a great time. Went to Copper Park as well. Another great park. Very clean. Great work, staff. Um, all right. Then with that, uh, we will go to scheduled items. Uh, looks like our first item is 8.1, day camps and work experience. Sure. Having us here. Um, my name is Ron Beal, uh, recreation supervisor. This is my uh, first summer actually getting to oversee the camp program and uh, the work experience program as well. And um, I'm actually not going to be doing the presentation. I'll introduce the, my staff member who's going to, but I just wanted to give a just real quick um, kind of a summary of what I got to see and, and go out there and, and for these camps. And again, yeah, being my first summer going to these camps and seeing how many smiling faces and kids that were, were just having such a great time, but more so the staff that were having such a great time with these kids. And it was such an amazing thing for me to see how many of these temporary staff just just eating up what they're doing out there, just loving the job that they're doing. And uh, that to me brought a lot of excitement, honestly. And uh, and then I, so in my process, I talked to a lot of the um, staff members asking them, you know, what, what got you into this? And, it was, I was shocked at how many said they were campers at one point. And so it was one of those things we were trying to do some research and see how many, you know, we had actually as, as campers that became CITs that became staff members. So hopefully in the future we'll have some of that information. And I'm not sure if we ended up pulling into that. Got a little bit of information. All right. So Ryan will share some of that later on. But um, again, just wanted to share that. And, um, and then in the process too is like as I'm the recreation supervisor, I kind of oversee these programs and everything. But I want to give a shout out to Ryan Shepard, who does the majority of the work. And and uh, again, I can't take credit for it. I just get to oversee it, and he should get the credit for everything that's done in those programs and stuff. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce Ryan Shepard, our recreation coordinator for many years over this program. He'll do a little presentation for you. We'll be here for questions afterwards. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, board. Thank you for allowing us to share our programs today. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ryan Shepard in the camps world. Uh, my name is Mr. Big. Uh, this is my 35th year working with the day camps programs, traditional day camps programs, um, working with the city of Santa Rosa and that whole time has been with those programs. Uh, I'm going to talk about today our tr traditional day camps and our work experience program. Next slide, please. And. Um, there we go. Um, and in the traditional day camps, we're going to talk about kind of what we did this summer, what we do regularly, a couple of our specialty camps, and something new we've got uh, cooking up. So we're excited about that. Next slide, please. So the three main camps that I oversee during the summer are our, our crown jewels, Camp Watam, uh, started in 1958, Elton Howarth Park, serving uh, 1,100 kids a summer. Uh, camp Yuchi over in Youth Park, I had the pleasure of getting that started in 1996 and serves about 480 kids a summer, and Doyle Adventure Camp, which is in Doyle Park, serving 540. Next slide, please. We're going to start with Camp Watam. So uh, Camp Watam, we get 130 campers a week out there. We have 21 staff, about 40 volunteers. We're putting in, um, over last summer, about 15,000 hours of community service, helping with uh, the camps programs. Monday through Thursday, camp runs from 9.30 to 3.30, or 3 o'clock, pardon me. And on Thursdays, the campers arrive at 1 p.m. So we bring their stuff up the hill. They do a parents' night for um, a big show for the parents with skits and songs. We get our t-shirts back, which are stolen every week. We have to figure out what happened to them and figure out how to get them back. In the morning, we have breakfast, and the kids go home at 10 a.m. The staff leaves at 11 after cleaning up and evaluating the week, getting us ready for the week after. Um, songs, skits, games, crafts, archery, lots of pretend, dodgeball, 
swimming at Spring Lake. We hike over there every Tuesday. That's a great respite for the, everyone to get out there and do something new. And as I mentioned before, the Parents' Night program. Watton runs for nine weeks during the summer. Next slide, please. Joint Adventure Camp was started in 1992, and the idea behind the camp was to provide a better option for working parents. If parents use the extended hours there, they, their children can be in camp from 7.45 to, uh, in the morning until 5.15 in the afternoon. It's Monday through Friday, I explain the hours. They have about 60 campers per week, about 11 staff, and about 15, 16 volunteers that work, work there each week. Um, another idea that we had in establishing Dual Adventure Camp was to center it around uh, field trips. And in doing that, we wanted to utilize the city bus transportation system, teach the kids about city bus, teach them the importance of public transportation and how it can help with the environment. So they do about four field trips a week, two to the pools. One is theme related. If it's Arctic Antic Weeks, we'll go ice skating. And then they go to Watong uh, for one day during the week to share the wonderful amenities we have there, such as archery, K-Land, canoeing, and the special guests. Um, next slide, please. Then we have Camp Uchi. As I mentioned, we got that started in 96. Um, for the first about seven, eight years, it had an overnight that didn't proved to be viable. We also had more need for working parents with a camp option on the west side of town to provide an option of daycare for parents. It's kind of a hybrid between Camp Watong and Doyle Adventure Camp. They go on three field trips a week. One is theme related for Pirate Week. They'll go out to the beach, etc. cetera. Um, hours are the same as Doyle for working parents, 7.45 in the morning till 5.15 if they need it. They swim twice during the, uh, during the week at Finley Pool, and they do theme-related field trips and have special guests as well. Next slide, please. So some programming challenges. Um, you'll see that they've changed from the last time I did a, a presentation, which is great. We addressed some of them. Uh, one of them is the aging infrastructure, especially at like Doyle Clubhouse. We really need that as our hub for protection against the elements of the weather, a place to meet, et cetera. Um, some things there aren't viable anymore. Um, maybe even some of them are unsafe, doors that are hard to open, um, window, window um, uh, screens falling off, and fridge replacement, other aging infrastructure things that have been there for a long time. We're having that a little bit at all of our camps, which we're going to need to address. Um, the weightless problem has gotten better, and we've done some things to address that. One of the things that we did is institute a 25% um, refund fee which dropped our refunds by about 80%. And if people are wondering why is that such a problem, what would happen is the parents would wait to the last minute to withdraw their children, and we'd have a wait list of literally 100 kids, but couldn't hear back from the parents in time. So 20 to 25 kids a week were missing a camp experience because we couldn't find them to get them in soon enough. That new um, system that we have with the refunds definitely helped and really made that easier. And then, of course, inflation is everywhere right now. The increase in costs, especially with security, field trips, uh, minimum wage, requires us to push our fees up every year. But I'm sure that's something that's happening everywhere. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, we did get our survey monkey out. We're not. We're, the responses are trickling in. As, as I'm a teacher of psychology at Rancho Cotati for the last 30 years, so. I do understand that 45 responses is not the best sample size, but the good part is the data we are getting is similar to what we've got in the past, and it's very encouraging. And I, I especially like the stat at the very bottom that even though inflation is happening, even though we have to keep raising our prices, we're able to be very competitive, and 97% is amazing. That feels that we are appropriately priced. Next slide, please. Some other specialty camps that I'm responsible for during the year. One is winter camp held right here in Finley. We do two weeks and we pretty much rotate those weeks around where the holiday falls, uh, both New Year's and Christmas, um, because we know we won't have attendance on those. So sometimes we have a three-day week, sometimes we have a four-day week. We do as many indoor activities as we can, all sorts of fun games, songs, t-shirts still get uh, stolen. We're able to integrate some newer activities like Baking with Big, that's a young Mr. Big there on the left, and they come in there on the first day of the week, 
and we make a sweet treat and we kind of introduce them to the kitchen, the kitchen rules. And then every week at the end of the week, we have pizzas for lunch and the kids get to make their own pizzas and then we eat our own pizzas. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, again, we run that for two sessions for working parents. It runs from eight to 515. If they need it, they can get extended hours. Um, spring break day camp is pretty much like Camp Watam Light held during spring break. Uh, it's exactly like the re regular program except for no overnight. Hours are 8 to 5 with extended hours for working parents. Finally, I'm responsible for Camp Kennedy, which is a camp for our differently abled population. We run this for one week every summer during the end of July. Um, it's a great program. We have 25 participants. We get tons of volunteers and tons of staff that beg to work it. We almost have a one-to-one -one ratio when we run that camp. Hours are a little shorter. We try, we're, we kind of consider ourselves camp experts and we work with UCP of the North Bay who are the differently able experts and they help provide us with expertise and some funding and we help provide them with use of Howard Park for their camp, Camp Chaos, the following week. So we're also providing, helping to provide another week for our differently able population in the city. Next slide, please. Something we're super excited about. We've noticed there's a need. Um, one of the we don't get a lot of complaints for Camp Watam, but one is, well, why can't my four-year-old or my five-year-old go there? Currently, the rule is they must be entering first grade in the fall following the summer. That's because of all the issues that happen with younger children and the intensity and how much fun we're having at camp. So we came up with this idea, Camp Watats. We're going to hold it in Howarth Park. We're hoping to get it started summer 2024. We've already began planning. Next slide, please. And if you look, I know it's kind of small, um, but hopefully you can see, we're going with three groups of 10 kids, three volunteers and two staff in each group. That'll give us a nice two to one camper to staff ratio. Uh, we're aiming, our target age is four to five years of age. We're gonna shorten the hours of camp a little bit um, just to make sure, because we're not gonna, we're not really in the business of providing a nap time and those types of things, especially with the facility we're gonna be using, which will be the gazebo. We're gonna focus on a lot of our similar uh, activities we do at all our camps, songs, games, skits, and really gearing those activities for the appropriate age level. It says archery in quotation marks because we're not going to be doing archery, but we're going to have some kind of projectile fun. We're working on it. We're working on something that will be fun, be similar to archery, but also get those kids engaged and hopefully maybe even help them help them for when they graduate to Watam and they are doing archery. Um, and of course, we need to work out a swimming um, situation. We want to integrate field trips, special guests, and also, of course, got to have the parents' afternoon program. So we're super excited to get that started. We definitely have models to work with, and we're doing a lot of research getting that ready for next summer. Next slide, please. The second program that I'm responsible for um, in my duties is the work experience. Next slide, please. Um, and so work experience is a program. We've always had volunteers for the city of Santa Rosa, but then when we started focusing on team volunteers for our camps programs and our other areas, we thought, how can we make this a better program? How can we give back to these kids that are giving us their time and give it back to their community? And we came up with the work experience program. And what we're trying to do there is give them that experience that will help them get their first job. As you see, it's for kids 13 to 17. They do pay for a fee. And when we get that question, why am I paying a fee to volunteer? We, it's for the training. It's for the uniform. It's for the field trips they go on and the food we provide to campers. We also, also provide for them. So it's a really unnecessary fee that we have to have. Um, but again, we had 267 participants with people wanting to register late. So we feel like it's a pretty fair deal. Annually, we're getting 25 to 30,000 hours of volunteer service every summer. We got over 26,000 last summer. We're very appreciative for all our teams for doing that. And it's a program that helps them stay out of trouble. They are around good teens. They, they want to be like those teens. They have those role models. They're getting practice with the interview and application process, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. And it really beats back that, that catch-22 that we all remember when we're getting our first job. I want to go get a job, but I don't have the experience to get that job. But I can't get a job to get the experience, so I'm stuck not getting a job. We bridge that gap. We give them the experience. We also are going to, next slide please, also going to teach them how to fill out an application, et cetera. So here again, we have some of the things that we're doing in the work experience program. One thing we're proud of, we now are using a PDF fillable app so they can email to us. One of our goals is to get everything online so that we're not taking any more paper forms. We're working on that. We want to keep 
the model that we're using saying we're going to get you a job current with current business practices. So we're trying to evolve as business evolves. Um, the kids get on the spot feedback. Not only do they evaluate the programs they're in, but they get evaluated each week. And before their evaluation, they get a, here's how you're doing. And at the beginning of the week, they get to say what their goals are. So we have a better idea of how to tell them how they're doing with their goals. And of course, um, again, I've been a teacher at Rancho. We have a 40 hour community service requirement for any graduating senior. So it's, it's everyone's winning from this. And we'll talk about that in a moment too. Next slide, please. If you break down what we do into the different programs, which I'll talk about in a moment, you can see they're getting all sorts of different skills. Almost all the positions give the kids customer service skills. Some of the skills they're starting to learn, uh, some of the positions are starting to learn the skills of handling money, et cetera. Uh, the swim aids and junior lifeguards are learning pool, deck, pool and deck supervision. And then um, anyone working with the younger kids, that would be the swim aids, the junior lifeguards, the LITs and neighborhood services at Howarth Park. They're getting positive discipline working with the campers as well. In camps, all the CITs have to make a 45 minute planned activity each week, which they lead, and they have to write out a paper that says the supplies they need, what the role their role will be, what the campers will be doing to having fun, and what the staff will be doing to support them. So they get to be on top and see this is what it would be like to be a counselor. Um, so to get that practice and planning activities and of course the valuable work experience. Next slide, please. So who benefits from work experience? I like to make the argument, next slide please, that everybody's benefiting. It's a win, win, win situation. Next slide please. Parents are winning because their kids aren't at home playing video games, making a mess, complaining about being bored, doing nothing, getting into trouble. They're out in a, in a supervised environment. They're safe, they're having fun, they're learning skills. The kids are winning because they're having fun, plus all the things I mentioned from the parents, parents and we know they're having fun because they literally beg for more hours and it's kid driven, not parent driven on can I have more hours because you can see the genuine disappointment when they can't get more hours. Um, and then our programs are winning. Those kids are our eyes and ears. They make our program bigger than it is. And um, in a simple way of saying it, they increase our staff to participant ratio. Without CITs, we'd have 15 campers in a group with two staff. With CITs, we have 15 campers in a group with six pairs of eyes on them helping them all week. Next slide, please. So these are the steps in the work experience pro uh, program. The first one is they're going to apply using that application. Then they're going to get a note from us saying, an email from us saying, hey, you need to schedule your interview. So now they're getting practice calling someone in an uncomfortable situation, setting up their interview. Then they come in for their interview. After we hear their interview choices and they go through their interview, we place them in their first or second choice. Then they come to orientation. Orientation is where we first all come together and meet each other. They meet me, they meet their program supervisor. They get their schedule for the summer, they get their work uniform, they get their work manual for the summer. Any of their in-person questions that they have will be there. We also tell them, hey, you guys did great in your applications here. But here are some ways you can improve on your applications so that yours will be put in the yes pot. We also go over some common things that they did very well in the interview, as well as tips for doing a better interview in the future to make them more viable job candidates. And then all the programs have trainings, including camps, and training can be anywhere from two hours during the week, where camps has as much as 26 hours for the week because there's so many different things. Next slide, please. So what programs do we offer? Next slide. We have CITs, counselors and trainings at all three camps. Those camps are responsible for about 19,000 hours of community service this summer. Next slide, please. In aquatics, we have swim aides who assist the swim instructor in teaching swim lessons. We have junior, junior lifeguards who assist the lifeguards in deck supervision. And we have fifth session workers who help in, with the sales of uh, treats and goodies at the pools. Next, please. We have leaders in training in neighborhood services, and they're doing kind of the same things that the camp CITs are doing, except for they're doing them for neighborhood services at different schools in the neighborhoods, helping kids who can drop in at their leisure or sign up as well. Next slide, please. We also have three programs in Howard Park. We have the Boathouse, where they assist on the dock and help with customers. 
um, the concessions in amusement where they're learning money skills, learning customer service skills. And I want to take a second on Animal Barn and just talk about that program. There they're learning animal husbandry. They're learning how to take care of these animals. They're learning how to clean up with, for these animals, learning how to feed these animals, learning how to show these animals to the public safely. Um, I got a special spot in the Animal Barn and that's because I have three children. Two of them were CITs. I tried to steer my daughter to be a CIT too. And she said, no way. I'm working in the Animal Barn. She did three years at the Animal Barn. That inspired her to go to Cal Poly. She just graduated last uh, June, magna cum laude, with a degree in animal science. She went off, she found friends in South Carolina, went off, and now runs an animal shelter in South Carolina. So the, the program, I, I felt the benefits myself, and all my boys loved it too. Next slide, please. So again, 14 is not a great sample size. It's unfortunate we had so many um, participants, but such a low uh, response rate, we might resend it, we might look at ways to get a better response rate, but the data is amazing. 100% uh, that's still up, so not everyone knows that I'm being on the level here. 100% said their team benefited for, from the program, that many said they'd recommend them to uh, another family, and most of all, they're all enjoying the program. Next slide, please. And that's pretty much my presentation. Thanks for listening. Listening, and if there's any questions, happy to answer. Nice. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the board? Omar. I have one question, one comment. I think the PDF we got had a missing. That last slide was missing, or had the wrong one uh, on our side. Okay. Oh. Uh, we have the 80 responses. 2023 awareness. Uh, okay. Um, that is this guy's fault, um, and that's because we were waiting for the data, I was waiting for the data to come in, I'm like, where is it, and then it finally came in, and yesterday I found it and just entered that, and that's probably why that happened, my apologies, gotcha, okay, because I wanted current data versus last year's. Uh, my question, question was, how do we uh, promote this? Uh, I recently graduated from high school, it's been a few years since I graduated, but I remember um, this is my first time hearing about this program, and it's a great program, so I was just curious on how we put that Okay, well, we actually have that as one of our survey questions, and I'm wishing I included it. However, from memory, the biggest um, marketing weapon we have is word of mouth, hey, that's an awesome program. I think it was around 40%. Um, and I can, if I, I can email you the data and you can uh, take a look at it. It actually says, did you hear it from uh, a magazine, from a friend, from you know, other camps, etc. So uh, we do have some data on that. Okay, awesome. I would like to look at that. Happy to share. Uh, board member Kwan, board member Kwan. Yeah, first question, how is it possible that you have a child old enough to have graduated from college? <laughs> yeah, you're not making me feel any better. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely feeling it, but that's where I'm at. So, Sugar turns 41 in mm. a couple of weeks. Um, Sugar is her daughter that was a CIT for us back when I was young. <laughs> younger. Younger, I'll take it, I'll take it, yeah. Uh, second question, The um, back in my day, uh, when Sugar was uh, at UCHI, there was still the overnight program, and now um, the two programs, Doyle and UCHI, that essentially offer full-time activities for working parents and their kids, how many of the 60 campers that are accommodated at those two camps are there pretty much every week, and how do you keep it? It must be challenging to keep it interesting for both the staff and the repeating kids yeah a couple of quests a couple of responses we will get is like hey maybe you could vary the activities a little bit and that's a very low level of response we do try and let parents know we're not daycare ever we get that in a pinch we could be and we actually discourage from enrolling in more than two or three weeks not only for that reason because we want to be an ex experts in what we do we don't want to keep branching out to things that we don't necessarily know how to do or how to provide it at a super high level. The other issue is, um, oops, I lost my train of thought. So, um, it was regarding you know, even as old as me, <laughs> <laughs> kids who came pretty much every week. Yeah, and so um, there's 
I think the staff do the best job at keeping that fresh because I would argue of all the activities, the staff are the favorite of the campers. And I know they're not necessarily an activity, but the personalities, the interactions, the mentorship that goes on there, the care, I think they feel that. I think that's our number one draw. Themes. Pardon me? Themes. Oh, that's, that's a great one. Thank you. So another thing that we do to vary it up is themes. So our meal revolves around the theme that week. Uh, if it's Western Week, you've got Bronto Burgers, the field trip, costumes, the t-shirts getting stolen, all of the songs and skits revolve around the theme. So there's another thing that kind of spices it up and makes it a little bit different week to week. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Smith? You are fabulous. This is oh. a wonderful program. You do look young, but you <laughs> aside that, the program is just, I can't thank you enough. Thank it's you doing much. so much good. Thank you. I, I do talk about it because we get to hear from you. And you know, and people don't know about it, but the people who do are thrilled. So I'm saying it's gonna grow in increments and it looks like it has. Yeah, it really has. And I wish um, the staff were here because they're the ones like doing all that work, making us all look good, and they're they are amazing. We're so fortunate. I didn't mention it, I'd like to mention it now. One of the amazing cycles we have in our camps is all the campers come in and they look up the CITs, I want to be a CIT. Um, and then all those CITs want to be staff. And speaking to Rob's comment earlier about some staffs, I pulled my staff. I had 47 of my 57 staff were campers. And I had uh, 45 of my 57 staff were CITs. And so now that we got that work experience program, and it was really amazing, I don't know like talking about COVID, but just to mention it real quick, it was really amazing when we had to shut down the CIT program and the work experience program, how it hurt all the other programs because we didn't have the support and we didn't have a staff feeder. Because when you have a CIT working for you or a volunteer, pardon me, for two or three years, you know what they can do and they know our system. So I kind of look at it as if anyone's familiar with baseball, you're taken from your farm system. And we love to do that because we know who they are, we know their programs, we know who the quality ones are, et cetera. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I have one more question. What percentage of the kids Friday morning go home sticky, <laughs> filthy, <laughs> and having had more fun than they've had? I'm going to go ever. about uh, 65, 70%. <laughs> and a school t shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with a, there's t shirts back, that's correct. I just have a, a quick question. Um, my kids are all grown, and my grandkids are all grown, but I do have some great grandkids now, and they're right at that age where they could be participating in some of this. Where can I get the uh, information or folder or brochure? Or um, so what we do is all the information, we do send out email blasts, and then we do put information on the city website, sandalreserve.com. And once you get there, it'll start listing everything, usually about mid-January-ish is when we have everything up for the following year, or the following summer. Is there any other uh, outlets that I'm missing? Activity guide. Activity. Activity, the activity guide, the, the paper activity guide, which is uh, in all the rec centers. Do we mail them out anymore? Uh, no. But they are available at the rec centers. They also list all the, uh, the programs that we offer in Parks and Rec and magazine style. Good, because they... Majority of them live here in the area, so I'm going to make sure they get a copy. Love to see them. Uh, just a couple quick follow-up questions. For the uh, CIT program, uh, you mentioned the $110 fee. Is there a fee waiver or hardship or like sponsorship for well, individuals? We do have some programs that help. For example, the LIT program is a $10 fee, and that's one that they can do, and they just have to go into that program and we set them up and they help at the different schools in neighborhood services recreation sensation. I'm just going to join to, to address that question because uh, yeah it's such a great feeder for us as, as Brian laid out so well um, and we don't want that fee to be a barrier so we've actually we're just starting conversations to roll out our recreation scholarship program for next year nice. and we are adding that program you know we have limited funds what we could do it there but we're going to add that program into it which we haven't done in the past um, which I don't think this guy knows yet. Um, but we're going to be including that one so that we can address that when, when finances are a barrier to participating in work experience that they'll be able to. And for those scholarships as well, is that available to campers in certain situations too? We have some for camps. Most of our scholarships go to swim lessons. Got it. Uh, but we also have some for some of our camp programs as well. Awesome. 
Um, Camp Kennedy also has what we call a campership. So instead of paying the full fee, they can pay, I believe it's 75, and then we pretty much subsidize the rest. And then that is a deal we worked out with UCP of the North Bay, and we get reimbursed for that. So, oh, nice. Yeah. And then as far as the transition from a CTI to an actual counselor, so uh, CTIs go to the age of CIT, 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 yeah. CIT, my apologies, uh, goes to the age of 17 and then they can become a counselor at 18? Or What normally happens is they'll start at 13, do two to three years, and at about 15 apply. Okay. The real dedicated ones will stay till 16 or 17 until they get that job and some move on to do other things with the skills they've learned as a volunteer. But they can become a counselor, so as we get 18, is that the year? 15, they can become a counselor oh, they can aide. Become, nice. So we advertise that our counselor aides are high school age and have at least a year of volunteer experience working with kids. And we also advertise that our counselors are college age, so that's how that works. And the counselor aides do get paid. Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Very cool. And I'm personally very excited for Camp Watots. I got little ones. All right. Well, we're excited too. I actually wanted to chime in on Camp Watots as well just to um, promote and thank the community for supporting Measure M, Parks for All, the county sales tax. Um, we're actually using some of the money allocated to increase recreation programs to kickstart the Camp Watots. Um, so excited to, excited for so many reasons to, to open that program, but also that uh, the community supported, uh, you know, parks and recreation through through that Measure M, and, and that's going to bring them Camp Watots. So, yeah, it's very cool. Well, thank you all. Uh, Madam Host, do we have any public comments on the item 8.1? We do not. No public comments. All right. Uh, with that, next agenda item is committee reports. Uh, I have no update regarding the mayor's lunch. Uh, let's see. Uh, Board Member Poit, would you please provide an update on the Waterways Committee report? I'd be happy to. Um, the Waterways meeting was literally the next morning after our meeting last month and it was a staff presentation on of all things the general plan 2050 update um, so it was a deja vu for me however because it was done by staff there was a tremendous um, emphasis on um, waterways and um, this accompanying spaces at the request of the board members so it was very much directed to um, how do we make sure the waterways and the accompanying paths and green spaces are part of the future development of San Marcos. Cool. Um, are there any public comments? Sure. All right. Uh, the Board of Community Services Governing Documents Subcommittee I personally do not have an update regarding that. Any uh, participating members have an update? I would defer to staff on that. Yeah, okay. I can provide a, a small update. We, we have been doing a lot of meeting and we are taking what we have so far and checking in with our city attorney's office as well as the city manager's office briefly before um, we come back here to provide it to the whole board for consideration. So it's moving forward. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Acting Director Santos, do we have any uh, written or electronic communications for item 10? We do not. All right. Thank you, Jen. Then moving on to uh, item 11. Uh, are there any items that you would like to see on future Board of Community Services agendas? Uh, what I said. Uh, yes, I would like for us to uh, consider uh, in the future not meeting every month, but maybe every other month, or if there are items that we need to vote on or be informed of, we are using uh, city resources for two people here right now for now over an hour. And I, I think we could probably, or we probably should discuss that. So we are not using, it feels like we're kind of wasting people's time if we don't really have an agenda that we all need to dive in on. 
Thank you for that. Jen, anything in the committee charter or anything? Does it have to be a monthly meeting? Do we have flexibility there? Do we know? The board has some flexibility, um, for sure. And we, we can, I can discuss that with the chair. Yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Certainly something worth raising. Uh, any additional board comments on that? Uh, having been on the board almost as long as you have, I don't know if um, these meetings simply serve us, but because they're recorded, they're also almost a um, citywide presentation of programs such as the camp program and um, how the year-long agenda, which we're presented with presentations, how that would be accommodated in, a, in an abridged, or would some of those be dropped off as possibly not needed? Um, otherwise, they'd have to be doubled up if they are needed. And um, the future agenda item, I know I mentioned this a lot, but um, 888 4th Street, I drive by it every day. They've got prices for how much they're going to be charging for rent. Um, an update on Fremont Park uh, in calendar year 2023, or is that something we won't hear about until next year? Future agenda item. Yeah, no, we, we, should, we should have an update this year. Uh, any additional comments, future agenda items? Well, I uh, will certainly note these, and I think the idea of either condensing or perhaps moving um, meetings and committees certainly worth discussing to see if you know, it's uh, viable for this board, for the community, and if it makes sense. All about efficiency, so if we can get it done in fewer meetings, by all means. Um, all right, with that, any public comments, future agenda items? Oh, sorry, no. Nope, no public <laughs> comments, all right. Uh, then with that, we will adjourn. Our next regularly scheduled uh, meeting of the board will be held on Wednesday, October 25th at 5 p.m. With that, I adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 6.02 p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh,